Okay, and so we're going to try this again. And so my first recording froze, so my big intro. Uh, I'm going to summarize my big intro. And that this, to me, is a valuable class because it's almost like a capstone in the sense that you're taking the HTML and the CSS that we spent 40 days learning. You're taking the C Sharp that we spent 40 days learning. And now you're combining the two languages and seeing now what can we do. Um, and so when we build applications, you know, this program is called Internet and Web-Based Technology. So we build applications towards the Internet. Right? Apps don't have to be built towards the internet. You could build mobile apps. You could build, you know, desktop applications that run, you know, when you double click their .exe like you did in the first 40 days. Um, but, but we're, this whole program is geared towards building applications that run via the web. Therefore, this is kind of like a capstone class. So it ties everything together. Um, there are some of our objectives here. You know, we're going to talk about the components of web applications. Um, talk about some components of a URL. We're going to, again, review static and dynamic web pages. You know, uh, some of this is review. Inter internet, intranet, you know, the HTTP request and response and round trip. Something that is big and new uh, is what is an ASP.NET web form? What is an MVC application? <laughs> Okay, the way this class is currently broke down, we're going to spend roughly half of our time learning each of these two technologies. They both are underneath the .NET umbrella, but their MVC is called a different design pattern. You literally, from a design standpoint, you solve the problem differently. Okay, so web forms are structured differently and built differently than MVC applications and so we're going to learn both. Um, web forms are a little bit more of the traditional approach. MVC is the more modern approach. As a matter of fact, in the latest version of .NET, it's called .NET Core and you guys might have seen that at the, the conference that we went to. .NET Core does not in, even include web forms. Okay, .NET Core only includes MVC. So you can say that web forms are being phased out. Okay, however, lots of companies still use web forms. Lots of applications have been built on web forms. There's still a market for web forms. Uh, we'll talk about the software components, uh, some of the libraries, and uh, we're going to look at some of the files, the ASPX files and the code behind files. So Really what we have when we look at this slide is a combination of what you learned in C Sharp, like a C Sharp drop-down list, along with some static HTML image, okay? But then in this exercise, and this is, this is a, an exercise you'll do in chapter one, right? You'll be able to drop down this list and I believe this list is populated from a database already, right? So you're going to get values from a database and populate this list. Then when you change the value on this list, it changes the image. It changes the text dynamically, and it changes the price dynamically. And then you can click on Add to Cart. Okay, so I don't know if we'll get all this in on Chapter 1 as far as you're going to, whether you'll actually build this in chapter one or it's not until maybe chapter two or chapter three, but this is essentially the exercise that we're going through. And you can see we don't just have a static HTML site. So that yeah. means we're going to have to be downloading our stuff? You're going to have, you're going to have some student files okay. that you're going to have to download that'll have the database and things like that. Okay. In. Yep. Okay. Uh, once you click continue, you'll, you'll be able to add items to a cart. I mean, so essentially what we're doing is we're coding our own simple shopping cart. We're building our own. Um, you'll be able to add items, remove items, continue shopping, and check out this will all be functionality that will be built into the site. Okay, and that's kind of the exercise. Uh, pretty simple graphic here. 
of uh, all the different devices we use to browse the internet that ultimately go to a web server. But when you have a static HTML uh, site, this is, is about as complex as it gets. Okay, we don't have anything more complex on this end of the picture. Okay, but now that we've got an application running, we need more than a web server. Okay, web server serves up HTML. But now that we have an application running, we need what's called an application server. Okay, so we need a .NET server. We need a server on the other side of this picture, okay, that's running ASP.NET. Okay, so it gets a little bit more complex now than it was before. Uh, this is just a review, right? The protocol, the domain name, the path that exists on the web server, and the actual file name up until now. Your extensions have been .html. Okay, that's just an example of a static web page. Okay, with a simple HTTP request with the web server, and then the web server responds with the HTML. So the HTML gets sent down to the client. It's then the client's job to render that HTML. When I say render it, I'm just saying draw the HTML to the screen for you to see. Okay, so this is a static web page example. Dynamic web page, you know, you now have moving parts, and so you, you need more than just a web server, you need an application server. Okay, so now you can see this picture gets a little bit more complex. This is typically what they call, this is very common, this is very, very common, this is what they call a three-tier application. Okay, so you can see the web server says, hey, I want a web page. It goes into, goes to the web server, and the web server says, wait a minute, this has some C-sharp code. This isn't a static HTML site. I need to pass that request on to the application server. The application server can run the C-sharp. That's where the C-sharp is hosted. Okay, so the, the request comes into the web server. It recognizes, wait, this is not a static web page. There's more to it. Passes the request onto the application server. Then if the application server has a bunch of data that it's working with, it needs to load that data from the database server. Okay, now you could call it a three-tier application. You could also call it, they call it an N-tier application. Uh, N representing, you, you know, three tiers. And like this picture, you would think, okay, there's actually three separate machines. That's what this picture shows you, three separate machines. But that's not always the case. One physical machine can act as all three of these roles. You could have one powerful server, okay, that acts as a web server, meaning it has IIS installed. It acts as the application server, meaning it has ASP.NET installed. And it acts as a database server, meaning it has SQL Server installed or some other database server, okay? So that's why you hear called three tier. You also hear called N tier just because um, multiple roles can be installed on one server. Right now, again, we kind of already hit on this topic on the slides. We can work with, and we will work with in this class, web forms and MVC. Okay, two different what are called design patterns, meaning two different ways to solving a problem. Okay, so the problem is we need a web application that maybe we need a shopping cart. Okay, and you can, from the design time, approach this from a traditional web form standpoint or MVC. Uh, there's some other uh, technologies that we don't cover as much in this class, like Razor. Uh, we'll write a little bit of Razor, especially uh, when we get into MVC. And that's where Razor is where you write C Sharp in the same document as HTML. So there's a syntax to actually write C Sharp on your HTML page, which is different than how we do it in MVC and in, in uh, our really in uh, web forms. Um, anyways, we'll, we'll, we will do a little bit of, of Razor. We will do uh, data entities, but again, we're going to focus on these two technologies.
This has really been simplified. We have Visual Studio 2015 Community Edition. Uh, a few years ago, um, there were all these different versions of 2012 Visual Studio. Uh, we still work with IIS Express. That's a free, when you see IIS, you just need to think web server. That's your free web server. And we're still working with SQL Server Express, uh, local DB. That's the version of SQL Server that we'll be working with. Um, if you're developing, when you develop on your machine, and we're developing web forms, um, notice here, IIS Express will be installed on your machine. SQL Server will be installed on your machine. That's how you get that end-tier experience all from your development machine. Okay. Now, in, in production, when you when you put this web application and if a lot of people are using your web application you know what would happen if you put your application server your database server and your web server all on one machine is that it would become overloaded it would become bogged down it would become slow that's why you might consider separating it out if a lot of people are using your web application but the point is when you're developing on your PC these are the pieces of software you download 2015 all this stuff will download with it. it's already downloaded on your machine okay we're just going to now start using it um, you can see here um, on an intranet development though like you might develop the work on your machine and then you deploy it to the server when you deploy your application to the server it becomes the server's job to host SQL it becomes the server's job to be uh, the web server or the application server then really all you need on your machine is Visual Studio okay and they call this intranet development meaning you develop it on your machine but then it doesn't save the files on your machine it saves the files on a local server on your internet same idea here behind internet development if you save the files across an internet connection it's really the same idea behind uh, what the software you need on the client and what you need on the server okay um, so it's just kind of an introduction I think it might be a good time to just demonstrate this because I do want to do hands-on you know how to write the code in that in these videos so let me launch Visual Studio here. It's taking its time. Okay, so here we are in our Visual Studio 2015. Um, similar process, we're going to do file, new project, or a quick way of doing it is new website. But I just want to show you that you can still do file, new project like you've been doing. And you know what? There it is, web. So under templates, we have a web and ASP.NET web application. Now, if we do file, new website, we get some different options. And so I typically do the file, new website. Um, because I like working with an empty website. If you do this, an ASP.NET web form site versus this, this is like uh, you're, you're working with a basic template. So you're going to download the basic web forms template. Or if you just say an empty website, you're starting with nothing. Okay. So in most of the examples, it's best to start with nothing. Uh, and then in the location, if we pay attention here, documents, Visual Studio 2015, all that's the same. Now it goes into a websites folder. So it's important to know the path. And then this is where you name the website. Instead of calling it website one, I'll call it chapter one demo for the class.
Okay, so you can see in our solution there's really only one file, and that's a configuration file. Okay, this is where we put in settings for our web application. As we begin to build web applications, we're going to have to change settings in this file. Okay, but right now there's really not much to look at. I'll open it up, and you'll see it's just an XML file. So you've all seen XML files before. Um, we will be changing these XML settings as we go through the class. Um, now to add your first page, you right click the project and there's always multiple ways. You can go add new item or you can go down to add web form. That's kind of the quick way of doing it. But just to show you add new item, we got a static HTML page but that's not what we're doing here. We're working with a web form. Okay? You can see right away the extension is different. The extension is .aspx. Okay? So these are not .html files anymore. Um, when you're working in the .net world, the extension is .aspx. Unless you go back uh, to what's just called traditional ASP. Before ASP.NET, there was just ASP. And then in those old days, your web forms would have just a .asp extension. Okay? It's kind of like Excel went from .xls to what is it now? XLSX or something like that? I should know that. I think it's XLSX. But the extensions change over time. Okay? And so now our, our extension is a .aspx. And our page name is default. This checkbox right here is important. Make sure to place code in a separate file. In the traditional .NET days, you would place your HTML and your C Sharp in the same file. Um, it's not convention for us to do that in ASP.NET. ASP.NET, you typically separate the two uh, separation of concerns. Your HTML in one file, your C Sharp in another file. So we place a code in a separate file, and I'll click Add. And we can analyze this a little bit. Okay. Um, here's our new page, default.aspx, and there's a little expansion node here that we can click and you can see default.aspx.cs you might take a guess and what goes in that file because this is a separate file notice I can open it and this is where our C sharp goes right funny so HTML goes here you can see our doc type HTML5 you can see our HTML header head tag, a body tag, you can see a form tag, and in that form we have a, a div. Uh, this is our source view. We have a design view, which will, this is your, uh, what's she called, a, a wussy wig editor. What you see is what you get, if you've ever seen that term before, meaning you can drag and drop tools so remember how I said we're going to be doing a lot of GUIs? Well, this is what your C-sharp GUIs was. You were dragging and dropping your, your tools from your toolbox. So for example, if I just drag a button onto here, this looks pretty similar to your C-sharp GUIs, right? Matter of fact, you can go into your properties of the button, change the text, change the ID and and it's just like we're building a C sharp GUI that you did in that in that last 40 days um, <clears throat> if I go back to the source code though you can see it generated a tag for me now this tag is not like your traditional HTML tag this is a server tag right and that could you know you, it's just given that title of a server control 
okay? And server controls begin with an ASP colon, okay? That's always going to be the case. Server controls begin with ASP colon, and then the type of control that it is, and the attributes are pretty common. Each server control is going to have an ID that identifies it, and they always have this run at server attribute. And then whatever other attributes, and there's IntelliSense if I hit space, these are all the properties that you can change, right? So you can change them in the code, or you can change it in the properties box. It does the same thing. Or you can change it programmatically through C Sharp. So just as I demonstrated a drag and drop functionality, that's okay, but I will tell you it's hard to position things where you want them. For example, here's my click me button. If I wanted another button over here, right, you might just think drag and drop it over here, see where it drops it, okay? You have to position things still using CSS. So it's not always that easy. Now there is a way under tools and options to use absolute positioning on everything. And that way when you drag and drop it, everything's absolutely positioned. But that gets pretty funky. I mean, I, I don't like building an entire site in absolute positioning. So. Yeah, yeah, real bad for a moment. I did it on the mission arm. Everything got screwed up. Yeah, I've never, I've never even attempted that. So, so I don't, I don't do that. Instead, what I do, if I need to drag and drop, I can. But I'm also fairly comfortable, you know, writing HTML. I just write a normal br tag and type in ASP colon, and these are my different server controls, and I want to label. And I'll give it an ID of label result. Always say run at the server. And the text is empty. And I close it, and you notice it closed the label tag for me. Now, if I go back to my design, you can see it did the line break, and I've got this label that's not visible. Um, to view this at this point, view in browser. You notice the default was Internet Explorer. You can change that, thankfully. Right? Cool. Well, it is a visual, you know, it is Microsoft Visual Studio. Of course, they, they choose Internet Explorer to be the default. And it doesn't do anything. You can click it, but you might expect that at this point. Right? You're probably going to have to program some C Sharp. Now, again, notice the extension, ASPX. Also notice this little... This little uh, icon here, when I click it, it blinks. Okay, that actually means something. That means what's happening is I am actually sending the web page results back to the application server for processing. It processes it on the application server, being ASP.NET, and then it sends the results back down to the client. Okay? That little process right there where you take the page, you send it back to the application server, it processes it and responds back. That's called a post back. Okay, that's an a very that's a very important process that happens that we're going to be working a lot with post backs, okay, in this class. So that's something that's actually happening here. Now, like you might have guessed, if I wanted to program an event handler. For this button, how might I do that? Double click the button. As you might have guessed, it generated an event handler inside of our C sharp file. Now, again, our default.aspx, this is our HTML. Our default.aspx.cs, that's our C sharp. The simple name for that is called the code behind file. Okay? It's called the code behind for obvious reasons. It's essentially behind your ASPX. And from here, I've got the label result. That's the ID of my label. Label result.text. 
we'll s keep it simple with our hello world. Save. And earlier, I just right clicked and viewed in browser. That's one way of viewing the page. Right click here, view in browser. That's another way of viewing the page. You can right click here, you can change your default, right? So let's launch it in Chrome. This does run it in debug mode though. I don't know if you noticed that. It does run it in debug mode. This whole view changes to debug and it loads it. Uh, in Chrome, click me and you see it did a post back. Now it says hello world. Again, every time you click it, you can see the little icon refreshing, illustrating you're doing a post back. Okay? Now, web forms are meant for rapid application development. I mean, what's nice about this, it's real easy to program buttons and drop down lists and text box and list box. It's pretty simple um, to code this. But realize there's a lot of code behind the scenes. So if I'm introducing Web Forms 101 today, the pros of Web Forms are that you can develop applications really fast. That's a big positive. Okay. The cons of Web Forms is that a lot of the code, I didn't type but one line of code here. Okay. So there's a lot of code auto-generated for you. When auto-generated code breaks, it is highly frustrating because you didn't write it. You didn't write the code, and it's breaking. And it's hard to understand why. Okay? So the, the pro of web forms, rapid application development. The con of web forms is when they break, it's, it can be very hard to troubleshoot, okay? It can be very hard to troubleshoot because uh, you don't write all of the code all of the time. Now, the other design pattern, MVC, is the exact opposite of that. And this learning curve for this, very shallow. Very shallow learning curve to learn web forms, okay? Matter of fact, you know, I don't think you guys are going to struggle the first half of this class because it's not as hot, you know, it's not all super complicated like MVC can be. MVC is a much steeper learning curve, okay? But MVC, you're coding everything, okay? You you have much more control in MVC, okay? But MVC doesn't have the benefit of developing applications really fast, okay? So just put those little disclaimers out there about web forms. You notice this is in a debugging mode now. When you click that play button, it goes into bugging versus if I just view it in browser, you're going to see it launches faster. It's not in debugging mode. Okay. And the same thing here. When I view this in browser, it's just faster. Okay. So you might've been saying, man, this kind of runs slow. Well, it's because it's in debugging mode. It's, it's doing a lot behind the scenes to allow you to debug, put breakpoints in, and trace your variables and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, this is a good point for a break, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording here. Okay, so we just got back from our break, and we're on uh, slide 16 here, which kind of describes three different uh, tiers of components. For, uh, for .NET, for the .NET framework. And we've been writing C Sharp, which is the most popular language in the .NET library. Um, years ago, Visual Basic was really popular. Uh, and I, I don't even want to say really popular, but VB6 was really popular, and then it transitioned into VB.NET. But C Sharp is where a majority of the jobs exist. However, I've had many graduates go out and support legacy systems that were written in VB6 and VB.net. Okay? And VB is a lot different than C Sharp, right? I mean, there's no semicolons in VB. You know, the, uh, 
the if statement isn't just if else, it's if then. It's just different keywords. It's all the ba basic concepts, but different different keywords in slightly different syntax. Okay, uh, because a lot of people knew C++. There's a Visual C++ language in .NET, and there's uh, a language called F# -sharp that never really gained popularity. But these are all different languages under the .NET umbrella. We just study C# because it's the dominant one. I yeah. He showed me some of his work, but it looks yeah. like Okay, so the question is, you know, I have a friend that learned C++. You know, what, you know, what, what is all about, you know, what is C++ all about? Um, that's uh, an old, older language, okay? Um, I learned C++ in high school. If you go to a traditional four-year college, you're probably going to learn C++. A lot of operating systems are built on C++. And so C++ is still a valid language to learn today. There's not a, a ton of demand in C++, meaning, um, you know, just there's not as many jobs in C++. But um, what I learned about C++ was that it's a good, it's a good first language because it's, it's really tough to learn, but if you can learn C++, you can then teach yourself just about any other language. Okay? So did that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay, just like a basic 101 on C++. Um, now, the .NET framework, realize when you download Windows updates, that's when you download the .NET framework. Right? If you want to go from .NET framework 4 to 4.5 to 5, you're going to be downloading Windows updates. Okay, and when you download the .NET framework, you probably see this, really what you're downloading are class files. I mean, you're downloading the .NET library, okay, so that you can develop applications using those classes and so that your computer can run those classes, right, that you download the class files. Um, the CLR, the Common Language Runtime, you're going to hear CLR a lot. Um, in the .NET world, it does a few different things. First off, the CLR, it holds the common type system. Uh, what the heck is that? Well, that's, those are the, that's the integer class. That's the byte and the double class. That's how we can write our data types that are those primitive data types. That's, those exist in the common language runtime. The CLR also holds the intermediate language. For those of you who studied Java, you're really familiar with an intermediate language. And we, you know what? We all did it in C Sharp. If we all think about to the early days of C Sharp, and Cameron, you're going to be really familiar with this process. First, we compiled our code into a .class file. Remember the .class file? The class file is the intermediate language, right? Then the CLR runs the class file to execute your program. Um, and, then, and then our operating system and hardware. Anyways, these are the different components of the .NET framework. Um, we work with these, you know, this is just, this is a lot of theory on this slide because these are just things that we're gonna work with as we develop these applications. This slide, slide 17, is an important slide to pay attention to because we're going to talk a lot about this in this class. And that is the, the topic of maintaining state. Okay. Now, when I say maintaining state, we've talked about that term before, state, but um, not a whole lot. Okay. And so maintaining state means maintaining information about a user, okay? And the first thing about maintaining state is it uh, HTTP has no way of doing that, okay? So if any one of you request a web page from a web server and then that web server responds to you, that web server, after that, it forgets who you are. It has no idea who you are after that. 
You say, give me a web page, you respond with a web page, and then that web server forgets about you, forgets everything about you. Okay, But maintaining state is the opposite of that. Maintaining state means, okay, you make a request, now the web server is going to remember things about you. Maybe you have a session ID. Maybe you filled out a web form with your name on it, and the web server can remember that about you. So maintaining state is the idea of tracking users and tracking information, which is high, uh, I don't know how I want to say this, there's a lot of money in tracking people, right? Selling people's information, right? So there's a lot of value to maintaining state. Not only is there a business behind that, but it's also there's benefits for the end user. If if a web server remembers where you live, then it can autofill some things out for you, and you can fill out a form faster. So, like, would that be like the cookie? Where they remember Cookies is one way of maintaining state. That is correct. Okay, but that's just one way. We're gonna learn four or five ways. Okay, so I guess the the main thing on this slide: realize that just using HTTP, HTTP is called a stateless protocol. It's a stateless protocol. It does not maintain state. It doesn't remember who you are. We're going to learn a bunch of different ways to maintain state. Matter of fact, here are, Danny said, you know, hey, aren't cookies one way? Yeah, cookies are one way, but cookies are built into JavaScript. Um, these are five ways built into .NET. Okay? And we're going to learn these different pieces here and there. Okay? Um, this will be one of the exercises you guys do for the labs where you could just do a simple GUI calculator, you know. Um, if I assigned everyone to do this right now, um, I'd have confidence you could all do it. A couple text boxes, a drop-down list. But if, if you don't feel you're ready to do this, that's what we'll be doing today. So we'll get you there. Um, this is going to be no. This is going to be a .NET web application. No JavaScript, just .NET. Okay. Yeah. And really, the rest of this is just demonstrations on how to do this. Now, look. This is the uh, design mode on their Visual Studio, and they use a table to place things, right? Um. Which is, which is definitely an option. We've learned that tables are the old-fashioned way of working with, with positioning. Okay, you can definitely still use CSS. Just a little bit about the, the folder structure there. And really, I'm not going to focus too much on the, the code here other than uh, the, the highlighted things. First off, this first tag in the page, this is called the page directive. I'll pull my code example back up, and I didn't talk about the page directive, but it's right here. Okay, it's got this funny syntax to open the tag, but basically it says the page language is C sharp. Auto event wire up is true. That's how we can wire up an event handler for the button just by double clicking it. The code behind file is default.aspx, and this inherits a class called underscore default. So this page will inherit another uh, uh, from a C sharp class. And uh, let me go ahead and stop this application from running. Uh, but just show you the page directive. Uh, let's see, they don't even really have any CSS code. Notice the form. I guess one thing I haven't pointed out yet either. Your ASP controls, your server controls, are always need to be inside of a form that runs at the server. So make sure if you're dragging and dropping, you know, don't accidentally drag and drop a drop down list outside of this form. Does everyone see this? This is a no-no, okay? If you've got a server control, it needs to go inside of 
inside of the form control. Now you guys know what a div is. We don't need that div, right? So that's, you can feel free to delete that or use it for positioning or whatever you need to do. Okay, now if I look back at design, you know, we can uh, edit items in here, add items. It's a lot of It's a lot of working with graphical. What you see is what you get tools, right? So now enable auto post back. So when we change the drop down list, it's going to do a post back to the server, maybe run some C sharp code or not. But keep in mind, as soon as I fill that out, it writes a bunch of code for me. So I wrote an ASP drop down list with some ASP list items. Drop down list, a text box, another text box, a label to store the results, a button to calculate the results. There's an on click attribute that'll have the name of the event handler in it. So on click, it calls the C sharp method button calculate click. So that gets auto wired up for us, which is nice. They also have a clear button that'll essentially clear the form. Then if you're looking at the um, code behind, right? The, the code behind for the default form, they put a method in on page load. They say if it's not a post back, they add items to the dropdown list. And it looks like they're just adding values of of uh, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. So this little syntax right here, on the page load, if it's not a post back, well, if it's not a post back, meaning if it's the first time the page loads. If it's the first time the page loads, they're adding items to this dropdown list. And what items are they adding? Just the numbers 50, 100, so forth and so on. We're going to work with uh, data validation and data validation controls. Um, but essentially, they're making sure if the page is valid, meaning none of the validation controls through an error, um, you do the calculation for the results. And that's when you click the button calculate. Right? If you click uh, another, what is this? Protected decimal calculate future value. This is a uh, <clears throat> another method that this method uses. Right? So calculate future value is actually called right here. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to focus on this too much. This will be some of the code that you, uh, you do for practice. And then the clear button, you can see, just clears the text box values. <clears throat> and resets the index of the drop-down list to zero. Okay, that brings us to the end of the first PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording here.